Okay, I'd like to invite uh, Annie Hudson. Annie is the program manager for the MIT Mobility Initiative. She's been working hard with me and Jinwa to get this thing off and running. And Annie's going to moderate uh, our, next, our next panel. Thank you very much. Robin, do you mind joining me up on stage so I'm yes. not so alone up here? And do we have and I think Salita. we have two panelists as well. Let's see. Let see. Although uh, maybe we let present. Hey Ben, thanks for joining us. Great. And Salita. Yeah, great to be here. Super. Okay, so it is my absolute pleasure to be moderating the equity panel. But before we get started, I did want to mention that we were a little skeptical about putting an equity panel for uh, for the event. Because the big theme of today is the integration of technology, data, and values, and really thinking about this in, in an integrated manner. And equity of, has, of course, come up in the, um, the connectivity panel, in the AV panel, data sharing panel, electrification panel, et cetera. So why pull out equity as its own thing? Uh, well, the easy answer is three fantastic panelists is one uh, reason to pull out equity as its own thing. And not just that, but panelists that very much think about this in an integrated manner. And so the, it's kind of an entree into how to really think about equ equity as um, executed from the nonprofit perspective, from the public sector perspective, and from the private sector perspective. Uh, so it's a very exciting panel, to say the least. Um, and so without further ado, I'll, I'll introduce our first panelist, Robin. I think we'll, we'll start with you and kind of the broad picture of the concept behind universal basic mobility, um, if you, you can introduce that. Robin is a, a serial transportation entrepreneur, uh, the founder, a co-founder of Zipcar, and a co-founder of Venium as well. Um, great to be here. So I want to talk about universal basic mobility, and I'm, and I was reflecting on this earlier with Annie. Is this about technology or about non-technology? And I'm hoping that I circle, and you'll see that it ends with a lot of technology. Um, so my favorite sentence is that transportation is the gateway to opportunity. And I feel like people who don't realize it's the center of the universe are just wrong and out of it. <laughs> we all know that there's nothing that you can do. Whatever you care about, transportation is the glue that lets you get there. So do you care about health? Do you care about education? Do you care about the economy? Do you care about jobs, education, all of these things? Transportation is your gateway or your closed gate to getting there. And if, what I've been doing some work on the... Um, I-90, and it occurred to me that in the last 100 years, we've made it easier to cross the ocean than to cross the road. And this is statistically completely true. All of these big projects that we've been doing have been really, how do we cross big chasms? So I was thinking, we also have the rail system. We also have airlines. And we have continued to muck up hyper-local travel. And I see this as something I like to see building back better. So what would universal basic mobility look like? And there are these three key things, and I should have actually been using the three E's, but economics, mobility, and access, and they can be translated into those three E's. So if we look at it from that perspective, what's been striking in the US and the rich countries around the world is that our transportation policy is a car-first policy, and we're seeing that with the emphasis everywhere on EVs as a solution to climate policy. So this is some interesting um, data. I want you to look at the left half first. So what portion of Americans' income, of an American's income, is spent on transportation? So it's 17% of household income on average. I use that number a lot. It raises over the years between 14 and 17% of your income. If you think about when you go to work, the first two hours at work are to pay off how you got to and from work. Um, the lowest quintile, the poorest 20% of families, it's 35% of their income is going to that. And then this. Um, data came in that I was just astounded at. So people in medium household income under 35,000 a year, more than 50% of their income, their household budget, is going towards transportation. And when we're saying transportation, what we're really meaning is cars. And then this graph on the other side, you can see the gradation. You will see there are some black areas. There are some counties where people are spending 80% of their income on their car because we had built this car-first universe in which if you don't have a car, you can't get a job and you can't pay off that car. So it is an astounding thing, the implication of a car-first policy. So oh, if it's not a car-first, if we have a car-first policy, well, who is excluded? 
And so I just have these three points. If you don't have a driver's license, you're excluded. And who's in that group? 30% of the people who are less than 16. What fraction of the elderly aren't driving or shouldn't be driving? Um, I found a number, 18% of the population is functionally disabled. 8% have had their licenses revoked temporarily. Or this is over time. Or you don't have access to a car. And people think, oh, everyone has access to a car. Well, 9% of households in the US don't. And then when you dig down on that, 19% of black households do not have a car. So when we have a car first policy, 19% of black households don't have them. And then there's all the rest of us that I want to include. 40% of households have one car. And when that one car is gone, you don't have a car and you are stuck. And then, of course, if you don't have money, cars, you know, can cost about $10,000 a year. It's in those numbers that I just went through. We've all seen this chart, this graph, this cartoon, which we've all been amused at and laughed at. And I was kind of thinking, with COVID, we've learned a lot about essential services, and we've thought a lot about where can I go, and we've appreciated localness. So while those pedestrians are getting a teeny fraction of the public right of way, they actually have access to essential services if you have a sidewalk. And so I want to just do the counter here. What if you don't have a sidewalk, which is most of America? And when you don't have a sidewalk, you have these types of things. So I've just been struck during the COVID piece that I want to say that there's 50% of the population who at any given moment cannot get out and get into a car for all these reasons. And I think of them as invisible. And when we think about transportation and this universal basic mobility, we profoundly need to think about all the people, not just the 50% that we put into this category that we've been paying attention to. And so circling to the end, um, a couple years ago, I worked with 10 of the largest NGOs that work in transportation in our cities. And I said, what is it that we all, what are values that we all share? What are things we all know without being highly paid consultants by cities? And so these are 10 principles that we put together. Um, they're the shared mobility principles. Had, we have several hundred um, companies that have signed on to them, and Numo was founded around this, this, um, these principles. When I go through and look at this, this is where technology comes in. And this is building the multimodal world that we need to be going to. And so if we want to support the 50% of people who don't have a car to go someplace, and we need to plan cities and mobility together. We need to focus on moving people, not cars. We need to encourage efficient use of space and assets, engage decision makers, design equal cities. I mean, all of these things are hugely improved by applying technology to them. And so I was thinking I was going to call out just a few that were technology related. And I think, no, you know what? All of these are improved by applying technology for communications or for CO2 emissions or for generating multimodality, which is the future. And um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Uh, we should be where we want to go and where does this initiative need to go. We need to deliver this on this universal basic income in a transitioning world to get to the place we need to go. Hi, Ben. Hi, Salida. <laughs> Great to I see think you. that uh, sets the stage perfectly for, for the next stage in the conversation. And you anticipated one of the questions I wanted to ask you as well, which is it, it features in a, a number of NUMO shared mobility principles, but it kind of how does it relate to all of them together and thinking about this as a comprehensive whole? So I'll, I'll get back to that later. But before that, I'd like to turn to Salida. If we can impose on you to talk a little bit about how this actually gets manifested in the city scale and what LA has been doing related to mobility equity. Sure, and thank you so much for inviting me to, to join you. Um, I should, we should give credit uh, to Alex Roy, um, who on a stage at a conference, I don't know, some, sometime in the before times, um, really sort of manifested this idea of universal based mobility. It was the first time I'd heard anybody use the term. And then I started sort of playing around with it and it's incredibly sticky. And after, you know, only sort of talking about it a little bit and hearing it now it's sort of everywhere and so I think it's really exciting that we can all sort of iterate towards what does it really mean because yes it's an umbrella for all of the good work that I think we've all been focused on and all been doing for a really long time but how does it take that further and how is it different um, and I would say that the when I think about universal basic mobility I, it is like if universal basic income and mobility as a service sort of you know, met on Tinder and went out on a date and then, you know, got married and had a baby. And that would be universal basic mobility. 
Um, but it's, it's more than that. So I think it has sort of three components um, to it. And really the end goal is, um, is giving people real sovereignty uh, in their lives and real dignity over, um, you know, real, real self-determination over the kinds of lives they want to lead such that transportation is not the reason why they can't. Um, it, it means closing the gap between the amount of jobs you can get to in an hour in your car and the amount of jobs you can get to in an hour in transit. And in order to do those kinds of things, we first have to focus on physical infrastructure. So, you know, the traditional sort of um, separated bike lanes, protected bike infrastructure, bus only lanes, um, you know, gold standard bus rapid transit uh, infrastructure, uh, all of those kinds of things, walkable communities and um, really uh, dignified public spaces that are free from traffic violence and other forms of, of state violence. Um, that's a piece of it. And then, as Robin pointed out, there's the digital infrastructure component of it. And so that does mean that cities have to undergo a digital transformation and be able to communicate um, their policies at, sort of at scale with private mobility providers that are offering services in cities to deliver really sort of um, outcome driven regulation. Um, but it also includes what I will call community infrastructure. And here, um, yes, I mean doing genuine and, and you know, context sensitive public outreach, um, but more I mean uh, this example. So we just completed a study on the transportation needs of women and girls in the city of Los Angeles. And unsurprisingly to any woman who's ever traveled in a city, uh, we're failing women in cities when it comes to, to transportation. Um, but what we discovered in doing really community-driven research, not just looking at quantitative data, but actually um, uh, bringing women and, and girls in to tell their stories, is that there is a 20% gender gap in driver's licenses in low-income communities of color, in particular Black communities and Brown communities in Los Angeles. Whose job is it to close that gap? because driver's licenses are going to be essential for, uh, for people to be able to get around. The car has a place in American cities, not the place it occupies now, um, but as a, as a way to extend the reach of public transit, as a way to sort of multiply and amplify the number of things you can get to. Electric vehicles and car sharing is a match made in heaven, and we should have EV car sharing that is free and available to every neighborhood in this city. Um, you know, however, how can we offer that without figuring out, you know, how women can actually access it? So com the community infrastructure piece of it to me um, is the piece that deserves a little more exploration, that offers more interesting opportunities for novel partnerships that we haven't really explored very much in the past, and asks us as transportation professionals, you know, to ex be more expansive about the definition of our job because when you start talking about universal basic mobility, you have to start talking about all of these other things that are really keeping people from being able to access um, things that, that enrich their lives. When you ask women, what are the opportunity costs? What are the trips you're not taking because the transportation system fails you? It is trips uh, like um, going to the beach. It's trips like going to be able to visit uh, their kids who live in another part of the county. It's trips like being able to go to their church on a regular basis. Um, those things are the things that really make a life, you know, worth living. They, they contribute immeasurably to our mental health and our sense of well-being. That's our job, and that's really what universal basic mobility ought to be delivering. So it, it really calls upon us to do much better across all three categories, um, but in particular to sort of um, be less restrictive about, you know, what we think of as, as transportation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn over to Ben in a second, but I was wondering, Salita, if you could, we've launched right into the concept of universal basic mobility, and if you could talk a little bit about how it fits within the larger um, schema of equity, how you see it kind of relating to, to, we talk about equity in such general terms, and what role UBM specifically plays with moving towards a more equitable transportation system. Yeah, I mean, in, in Los Angeles, you can look at um, specifically the, you know, we, we are the, the poster child for what happened to, um, you know, communities that didn't have access to power during the Eisenhower freeway building boom. 
And what happened to those communities is that they, you know, they got bulldozed to make way for these gigantic footprints. And they got locked out of the generational wealth building that happens from home ownership. And instead, they became part of a, a generation, generational cycle of trauma and poverty. Those neighborhoods, in particular, the ones that are next to uh, the 10 freeway, the, the 110 freeway, um, sometimes surrounded by up to five different freeways, they have the worst air quality in this country. Um, and they also happen to have the, the, the least access to, um, to credit and to banking, uh, and the largest concentration of zero vehicle households. Therefore, they are already paying a disproportionate time tax to access opportunities um, because of the way that our, our transit system has sort of fallen apart, in particular around freeways. And so universal basic mobility, like Vision Zero, um, if we get the metrics right, and if we get buy-in and can collectively organize to push it forward as a framework, it will drive investment um, towards those communities that have suffered uh, the most harm from the legacy of the, the system that we've built. So universal basic, you know, who has universal basic mobility right now? Um, it's anybody who, you know, is wealthy and, and has a smartphone and has access to credit. Those folks have universal basic mobility, um, but there are, are, are this, these other groups that don't have it. So if we are able to say, all right, UBM is about closing the gap for people who don't drive um, between, you know, how many jobs they can get to without a car, it will naturally push us towards these neighborhoods that have high concentrations of first-generation immigrants, um, and in particular, Black neighborhoods um, that have sort of, uh, are, are struggling with the most disproportionate negative impacts um, of, of transportation legacy that, um, that, that we're inheriting now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Ben, I, I know you do have a hard stop at, at 445, so we won't hold it against you if you, you jump off when, when you have to. Um, and I know Josh has offered to jump on stage to, to offer a little bit more context for SPIN. But I think Salita set the stage very nicely for um, uh, you to talk a little bit about the work that SPIN has been doing. Ben is the CEO of SPIN, um, and I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Yeah, so the origin of SPIN's participation um, in universal basic mobility really comes from the Pittsburgh program that we were part of. It's called Move PGH. Um, the director there, Karina Rex, who's now at FTA, had this vision of combining a bunch of different mobility services um, you know, with the private sector companies all cooperating together into a seamless mobility as a service offering. And Robin was instrumental um, in putting this together as well. Um, and what it ended up as was Zipcar for car sharing, Spin for bikes, the local bike share system, the local bus system all merged together through the transit app online um, and then offline at mobility hubs. And so for the first time in any of our markets, we have this package of mobility services um, and Director Ricks rightly identified that there'd be an opportunity to really offer subsidized access to so basically free access to these services um, and then study the effects of it and provide ride coaching uh, to make it possible to actually use these services because it needs to be just as easy to get around without a car as it is with a car um, and far more affordable. Um, and then in partnership with Carnegie Mellon, we're gonna be kicking this off at the beginning of next year and studying the effects. Uh, since then, we like the idea so much and you know, other cities like Salida in LA and many across the country have seen the opportunity here. Um, and so we're also participating in pilots in Bakersfield and Oakland, California. Um, and we're working with the University of California Davis uh, to study the results there. And, you know, like Salita said, this is a great story. Um, we need to make sure it's a great reality that's actually having the intended effect. And we don't presume that we're going to be able to predict every impact here, but we want to work with the cities um, who know best, who understand what their residents need to get this to residents and study the, the effects so that we can build on it um, and take advantage of the momentum that the idea has. I, I think that that would be my next question: Is how how do we make this a reality? This uh, panel is is great because we have the nonprofit perspective, we have the public sector perspective, we have the private sector perspective. If can we just put you in a room and and we'll emerge with a, a perfect system? Or how exactly does this work? What what roles need to be fulfilled? What is missing um, that that this isn't more ubiquitous at this point? And I know that's a very difficult question, so I will sit here in silence until uh, one of you takes the bait. Salita, you want to go first? Yeah, I was just going to say, first, we've got to define it a little bit more sharply and crisply. I think at the moment, it's a really sticky idea, and it's all—it's a little bit of a vacuum. So it's 
it's helpful in that way because we're in this kind of a moment where there's just a ton of ideas circulating. But I think first and foremost, we need to clearly define what is the outcome? And then that will lead us to need to define things like, okay, well, if my job is to try and make it so that even if you don't own a car, you can get to just as many jobs in an hour, then how do I quantify something like an EV car sharing pod versus a, a free electric bike library versus a new uh, bus only lane? Um, and how do I begin to sort of put those together to close that gap from a programs and infrastructure perspective? And then how do I, how do I um, uh, engage or activate um, community-based organizations? And, and maybe the best word is invest in community-based organizations um, to help us really to better inform the use cases that we need to serve, to bring together the, the real experts um, who are the people in the community that are gonna use the service and to compensate them for their emotional labor and telling us government, uh, you know, an entity that is responsible for a lot of harm um, and that they don't trust, telling us what we can do um, to make their lives better. So I am really excited and hopeful that we can, we can really move, get uh, folks in the academic community to start calculating, you know, what is, we talk a lot about cost per rider when it comes to public transit. How can we talk about return per rider, return on that investment, um, and, and create those, those things that will really then allow us to go out and apply for those for funding to do those things, um, or insist that private companies provide some of those things while they're serving the wealthier parts of our city in order to close that gap, if that's the gap we want to close. So I think that's kind of where we are in the life cycle of the idea. Um, and, and there's just a lot of really cool work, I think, that could happen in really short order. And the time is now because there's a lot of discretionary dollars in that infrastructure bill um, that USDOT will be able to articulate programs for. Uh, and that's, I think that's one of the opportunities that we could take advantage of with this particular administration that really understands what we're trying to do. We're not big into calculating here at MIT, so you'll probably have to look elsewhere. Uh, ben? Um, on the yeah, on the private sector side, is, I'd say there's two things that we're thinking about a lot um, right now. One is on the tactical execution front. So, like, how do you actually do this? Um, in Pittsburgh, we have these services integrated, but how do you pay for the trips? Um, and the cities are all taking slightly different approaches. Um, the best idea that I've seen so far is sort of a prepaid debit card um, that you send to people and also provide coaching that is basically set up so it can be only used for the eligible transportation modes, but can be used as much as, uh, as the rider wants. Um, so tactical execution is something that we're thinking about uh, a lot. Um, the other thing we're thinking about a lot is like, how do you create the right incentive structure um, for this to scale up? Um, there's this inherent challenge for private companies that you know, are in very competitive, low margin spaces. We're not in crypto or NFTs. Um, how do you get them to actually want to scale these services out? Um, we found some foundation partners early on, the Mellon Foundation in Pittsburgh that have thrown in. We've thrown in a little bit to support the, re the research. Um, but to really scale it up, you know, I think what Salito is saying is key. You know, these $13 billion in CMAC funding that you know, we think are now you know, can be used um, on multiple categories of transportation, including shared micromobility, we've got to find a way to get that money into the hands of cities and transit authorities um, and deployed against very specific best practices in terms of how to execute this idea. I feel like one of the things that's missing, Salido is right, we have to define this particular, what is it they're trying to achieve. And I look at universal basic mobility as what is the mobility foundation that should be offered to every human? And I was just struck that mobility should be a human right. And as we've added in cars and car infrastructure, we've lost this human right of actual free mobility without a government issued permit to go someplace. And you know, so I definitely think we had, to, I ran a workshop and there was a lot of discussion on this. And so I feel like, can we get all people to essential services or to specific utility requirements in their life? So jobs is one thing, but there's education, there's health, there's food. And are we only talking about people who are 18 and older or 16 and older are we talking about all of those people. So that definition feels crucial to me. And to this, where's the money coming from? I mean, I'm often asked, well, how do, 
how do scooter sharing, how do bike sharing companies, what's their business model, I think. Their business model will never exist until we charge the real price of space for on street parking or the real price of CO2 emissions. Like right now, you have no incentive to use a smaller, smaller footprint, zero emission thing if you can throw up those externalities for free. So to all this money that's coming, what are our priorities? And if our priorities are we need to build, provide sustainable foundational transportation to get people to key essential services as a basic government service, well, then I should stop expanding highways. Like That's not getting me closer to this basic fundamental goal. Because there is this money, and how do we start prioritizing it? One thing yeah, I, I just wanted to add, add one oh, thing quickly, which is that during the pandemic, a lot of cities launched um, in LA, it's called the Angelino card, sort of a debit card that got issued. It had preloaded, it had um, for, for folks who really needed um, basic, you know, to be able to go get food and, and all of the other things that people were really struggling with um, during the darkest period. And LA is also launching a big universal basic income pilot. These are opportunities for universal basic mobility to go along with that, because actually one of the concerns that arose um, around universal basic income is, and this is this is very depressing, but that by giving people $12,000 a year, that might actually put them above the threshold for certain other government support services that they can currently use and access for free without actually paying them enough to replace those services um, themselves. However, if you combine something like, you know, a bike share pass, a transit pass, um, maybe some, uh, you know, credits with the car sharing, maybe some TNC credits or some express lane credits um, all into one and put those on those same, that same debit card and had that be part of universal basic income, that you might actually be giving people something that is even more valuable than just the straight dollars because they can still access the services, they have supplemental income, and now you remove, to Robin's earlier point, that transportation burden on their household budgets. So there's a lot of other stuff going on that I think UBM could really fit into, but we really do need some, some more solid, um, solid ways to articulate what we're trying to accomplish. That actually is a great segue to, to what I wanted to ask about. And John, I'm not keeping track of time, so please do let me know. One uh, minute, one, more, more, OK. okay. Uh, is, um, the question of infrastructure is um, one of the things that we've been talking a lot today is about how transportation requires really intense investment in infrastructure. And one of the reasons why it's really exciting today is um, the software has launched so far forward for things like connectivity, electrification, et cetera. And, and there's this accompanying infrastructure investment that still has to happen. And so in the context of equity, a lot of the solutions we talk about are, are kind of the, this digital easing, um, a lot of what's been talked about here today that can kind of be a band-aid for so long. But is there also infrastructure investment that has to happen uh, over the short, medium terms to make this UBM more of a reality? Obviously. <laughs> yes, I, I'm going to look at Salida, but that is the whole thing, that we've been giving everything to cars, which is the most expensive space inefficient alternative and we can't get that right of way back as the person who spoke just before me was talking about. So we need to do a lot of space reallocation and make it safe. Yeah, and, and we have to rethink how we, the financial incentives for delivering transit that was is primarily focused on nine to five workers with white collar jobs. When we know that commute trips actually make up a very small number of the trips that any of us take in a given day. And that's particularly true for women who are doing unpaid household labor and need to make all kinds of middle of the day trips, the transit system and the funding streams and incentives that are built in don't reward that off peak service that could do a lot of good. So there are levers that we could change even right now today, absent an infrastructure bill that would give us a different system. But I'll just point out, I'll say the quiet part out loud here, which is that, you know, white dudes planned our transit system and our highway system. So we need different people at the table um, and I know this panel in particular, we're talking about equity. When I talk about equity, I mean racial equity. Um, but we also need those voices, you know, in positions of power and influence, making those kinds of decisions if we want different outcomes around infrastructure. And I think it's not just the, um, we also have to take a more expansive vision of public transit and what we fund with those dollars so that we can incent more creativity and actually deal with the fact that until the land use really changes, driving a car is gonna be an essential part of being able to achieve universal basic mobility 
but we have to divorce auto access from auto ownership um, in order to get away from 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 this sort of cycle that we've that we've ended up in. Wonderful, thank you, Ben. Ben, do you want the last word before we get kicked off the stage? Um, yeah, I, I think the infrastructure is a huge piece of it. I mean, it's well understood that if you build it, people will come um, into the bike lane. Um, and we see these images from Paris where you know things were all cars and vans five years ago, and now it's you know more than 50% scooters and bikes um, in a lot of the city, and they're trying to be a bike city. Um, the U.S. is not Europe from a density perspective. Cars are definitely a necessary part of the equation. Joining you from uh, Dearborn today. Um, but we do need to really increase um, the miles of bike lanes out there. Um, and I know, you know mayors and DOT directors all across the country have sort of used the crisis as an opportunity to make fast progress. Now we've got the infrastructure bill behind that. Um, we need to find a way to you know, even amplify that progress um, because people will come if we get the bike lanes built. Wonderful. Well, thank you three so much. This has been fantastic. And we look forward to continuing this conversation. Super. Thank you so much. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Robin.